Hi, everyone. Um, so finally, we're here at the final remarks. Um, and I want to say thank you to Lisa for inviting me um, to participate in this gathering and to everyone involved in making this happen, especially the presenters. Um, it's, been an off it's, been, it's an honor to be offering the final remarks. Um, but of course, that honor is also a challenge given the scope of contributions we've seen here over the past two days in the task at hand, uh, which is to offer a summary of sorts. Um, but this challenge also fits with the subject of this meeting, uh, which is practice and what that means, especially when taking into account the multiplicity of practices we have seen, from Jennifer Wenma's interpretation of Chinese opera and Uma Shankar Mandravadi's investigation into the acoustics of archaeological space and Amina Ahmed's interest in a universal humanity. <clears throat> So, in keeping um, with the spirit of Field Meeting 4, I wanted to first share how I see my own practice. Uh, something I actually rarely talk about, given the fact that I am, aside from being a writer, editor, and at times educator, um, an artist who actually one colleague describes as someone who went undercover. Um, the, it was based on a decision that I made uh, when I realized that my goal was to take the art world itself as my subject, which led me to writing as my medium of choice. Uh, and by art world, I mean the global network that makes us a global culture industry, of which we are all a part, uh, made up of nodes, agents, and sites that form the contemporary art world's transglobal public space. And it's in this world that I have been able to think about issues of hybridity, history, and transglobal and post-Western solidarity in the 21st century through a series of overlapping frames, one of which was globalization, its relationship to Western modernity, and its manifestations across the post-colonial, post-Bandung world. Uh, within this study, which I see as fieldwork, uh, writing is a material discipline, not unlike painting or sculpture in which words become tones in a palette, in fact, when it comes to the relationship that I have with my work, I think of two things often. Uh, the first is the literati tradition in pre-revolutionary China, when painting was often seen as a deeply reclusive and personal act for scholar bureaucrats. And the second is a section in Plato's Phaedrus, when Socrates describes a good text as a live body. And uh, Socrates actually talks about feeling like his own body is a vessel through which words pour in from some unknown source. The notion of writing as a live body, evolving, reactive, and changeable, is the perfect way for me to understand not only my practice, but the questions I consider within it, related as they are to the cultural politics of the art world, as fragmented, transitory, transglobal, and historical as it is. I am under no pretense that this world is innocent of the contradictions that characterize our times. In fact, it is one of the ultimate sites to study those very contradictions, an engine of a problematic and at times neo-colonial process that is affecting us all, whether we know it or not. Uh, within this process, I am at once an active, passive, and complicit participant, and my study has become the practice itself predicated on experiencing, observing, and at times submitting to the forces of global politics from within the privileged and contentious space of culture so that I might make modest attempts at representing what I see. All of which brings me to uh, what I've been asked to do this meeting, which is to offer some kind of conclusion to what has been discussed over these past two days. The task is daunting because it is ultimately an act of representation. I thought about this yesterday, particularly when watching Heba Amin's presentation, which considered the new norm and representational perspective facilitated by surveillance technology, uh, surveillance technology associated with the military industrial complex and by association, the narrative of imperialism, that is, quote, the detached and observant gaze of the aerial view, unquote, in which, quote, the language of occupation and colonization has been written into the visualization of the landscape, unquote. Somehow, I equated this with my own position as a writer, trying to capture an all-encompassing view, in this case, of Field Meeting 4. But of course, this is how it always begins, that is, representing complexity, which may explain why Michael Jew ended his presentation with a number of parting questions, namely, quote, how to pose questions of place and location that are so overwritten by generations of trauma or conflict over that very place's identity? 
What are the alternatives to synthesis, homogenization, unification, and assimilation? Can there be simultaneous pluralistic viewpoints?" Unquote. I believe these are questions we are all asking ourselves in this room. No less in the frame of field meeting itself, curated by Lisa as a gathering in which we have all been invited to be vulnerable together uh, and share our experiences of thinking through the world as we know, see, and feel it. For Heba, the task is about weaving histories, many multiplicities, into a meaningful story. In the case of Ho Tsun Yen, it is about using fragments to reach out to a bigger whole so that history might be opened up to other forms of life, narratives, and broader ecological concerns. Just as Nora Razian uh, described her work with the Sursok Museum through the task of binding the history of the institution with the history of the city of Beirut itself in order to create a true public space. The reason we all do it appears to be one and the same. As Shazad Daoud put it, each layer has layers. The fact is almost a given. Thus, why would we only have a singular rabbit hole? I'm quoting Shazad now. Um, after all, so much of what we do is about making these rabbit holes, be they gaps, absences, portals, absent, uh, presences, uh, not only making these rabbit holes not only visible but tangible, no matter what these rabbit holes are or what they lead us to. Uh, I relate to this deeply as a writer, because every word is a rabbit hole the minute you try to put thoughts into sentences that might somehow articulate what it is you want to say. And there is a trap in trying to grasp any totality, which one might call any attempt at representation. The more we go in, the more fragmented the whole becomes. If we try to contain that fragmentation too much, the expression becomes a rigid rather than live and discursive. To strike the balance is part of the process, which one might call the practice itself. Something I have seen Yona Stahl develop in the New World Summit, a, di a discursive space that is meticulously designed to offer a framework through which pluralism might exist by creating the conditions in which the relations, even if they are rooted in difference, become the common ground upon which we might truly hear and see one another. Here, as Michael Jew said, the form becomes a doorway that makes us vulnerable so that we might lay it all out. The e efficacy of such formalism is palpable too in the way Basil Abbas and Ruan Aburame have honed a formal compositional language that tempers a very specific urgency and intensity so that a threshold of universal universality might be created from real struggles to which our connection has been severed or blocked so that those who have been made absent are brought into presence. As Wafa Bilal put it, quote, the role of the artist is to act as a mirror reflecting social and or political conditions, unquote. Or to borrow Mary Ellen Carroll's words, quote, the work of art is successful if it makes us aware of our own existence, unquote. And yet it seems that even this success of creating a mirror through which anyone might find a reflection of themselves or the world around them can sometimes and unintentionally harden the walls of the echo chamber that the art world can so often be, particularly now, at a time when, as Boon Hoi Tuan noted this morning, quote, we are seeing the rise of regimes bent on driving people into tribalist containers, unquote. A phenomenon that the art world must resist, particularly when thinking about the global condition so many of us embody, be it through history, circumstance, or choice, that is, of belonging to multiple worlds and inhabiting different spaces at once. Thus, it is no surprise that the question of the art world's elitism was raised throughout the meeting, given recent political events. We heard it yesterday when Xiao Yu Wang, in conversation with Chan Zhao and Suza Cruz Bikani, asked how we might do away with the art world jargon in order to speak to or become effective for other groups within society, or no less to speak to each other on clearer terms. Yesterday, during a panel, discussion, Susie Afridi put it in pretty blunt, bluntly when she suggested that Trump could have won because art's high-minded esoter high esotericism, as commendable as it can be, can in fact alienate rather than include a wider audience. Today, we heard of ways practitioners are responding to the challenge. Mami Katauka's presentation in which she presented projects geared towards speaking to a wider and broader audience, and Ye Funa's articulation of how her own practice, rooted as it is in breaking boundaries between the exhibition space and the space of daily life, being two examples. 
This desire to reach out, make connections, and transcend or transgress boundaries and current divisions speaks to the need for gatherings like this. As Boone described it, more a communion than a conference in which empathy might be practiced in earnest for a multitude of different reasons, from uncovering forgotten stories, writing parallel narratives, filling in knowledge gaps, dealing with trauma, proposing new perspectives, or simply posing questions to your peers, as Yasmin Jahan Napur asked while making roti from scratch on stage, like, who are you? Where do you come from? Are you angry? In this regard, Lisa's invitation for us to speak together in this meeting in simple and direct ways feels vital. I think what she means is that we speak with sincerity and conviction, be it with humor and or, formal, and or with formal precision. As Anthony Lee noted, words cast spells, and as Heber said, the fictions we tell can become powerful truths in the world. It feels like the time has come for us to think about that again, and how the potency of our work might act in the world beyond our own. This is where the bridge Christina Yang referenced in her opening remarks yesterday comes in, related to Homi Baba's location of culture, in which the boundary is the place where something begins its presencing, and the bridge, quoting Heidegger, gathers as the passage that crosses. All of which brings me to what I have read practice to be, based on the meeting we have just participated in. At one point during the first panel, Claire Davis wondered if what we are seeing was not so much thinking practice as practicing, with the former implying a certain remove. To this, I would respond that practice is the process of thinking. What Lisa described as the journey we each take as we move through and in the world, filtering it through the lens and membranes of our body, brain, heart, and soul. As David Richardson said of his own definition, quotes, awareness, aliveness, consciousness, every day, that for me is the practice, unquote. In this light, the work becomes the manifestation of the practice, or the thinking, as it progresses. A bridge between the real, the maker, and the representation, for which the thought becomes the water, the channel, the wave, or the energy that keeps on moving. Or we could go for another analogy, that if practice is the pursuit of manifesting our thoughts, the work the, that these thoughts produce are the formal signposts marking the wayfinding cartographies or anti-cartographies of bodies out in the field, constantly reaching out not only for each other, but for the unknowable, the edge, the beyond, the transgression, the transcendence, or as Michael would put it, I'm quoting Michael Dew a lot, limitless space within which new possibilities, new imaginations, and new configurations, or as Erin Gleason described it, the expression of new vernaculars are waiting to emerge. We have seen this space being produced throughout this meeting, no less in the final panel, where Khalil Jarej, Joanna Haji Thomas, Rashid Rana, and Ho Rui An all united, were all united by one thing, or many. The way art as an expansive field continues to offer us the tools by which we might interrogate the peculiarities of our presence, take history and the future into our own hands and imaginations, and counter or uncover official representations and sanctioned meta-narratives so that we might consider how we choose to engage with a world that we all ultimately belong to. But while such expansive spaces are formed through the intricate exchanges of the art world that the art world can so often mediate, these exchanges do not presuppose a unity in which we, become, we come together as some kind of congealed one. Rather, these are sites of active contradiction, in which we, allowed, we are allowed to not only be who we are in all our complexity, but share our knowledge along the way in, in encounters such as these, without fear, in solidarity, and across languages, be it poetic, in the case of Raha Racina's presentation the day before, performative, as in the case of Ti Yong Chung and Lu Han's contributions today, and nonsensical, as Me Too Sen exemplified on both days. So what does this mean? Claire Davis asked as much when she raised the following question on the first day in the first panel, which I'll quote now in full. If practice is something you have to do, a thing you do because you do it, how does that connect to the politics of the work that is implicit in each case? What does it mean to practice in a moment like this or propose different ideas of legibility, communication? 
To this I would say, it means everything insofar as it means something to each of us in this room. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.